You can call me Richard. I have to be very careful with the information I'm sharing with you because it is extremely sensitive. But what I'm about to recount are the events that happened to me between 1989 and 1991. All of these things I'm about to tell you took place in Yellowstone National Park and I believe are a part of a grander conspiracy to hide the truth. Yellowstone, for the most part, is a very peaceful park, a great resort for many to escape all their troubles and worries of everyday life, and a chance to see an abundant amount of wildlife that they wouldn't normally see, beautiful mountains, beautiful surrounding, everything you could possibly want out of a campsite and outside adventure. But what many people don't realize is that there is a much darker and much more sinister side to Yellowstone, and today I'm going to unveil some things you probably didn't know. Some things that are so bound in conspiracy, you would not believe them if I had told you. I had already been working as a park ranger for about two years prior to these events happening. Everything started happening around the summer to fall of 1989. It started by receiving a call from one of my fellow partners. Many of the rangers on our team also worked together and very closely in unison. We had been called to go investigate a campsite that had been apparently attacked in the middle of the night by what they had suspected was wild animals. Now, this camp sat on the northern end of the far part of Yellowstone Park. And upon arriving there, we noticed that not only was the entire campsite destroyed, but there were three bodies discovered. All three of them horribly mutilated and torn apart. Once we kind of observed the surrounding moor and any evidence we could find, it appeared that these people were attacked and killed by what we would suspect to be wild animals. It did not appear to be the case of a murder or any foul play present. The killings were apparently done by wild animals of some sort. We were not able to determine what exactly. Part of us figured it was bears, the other part figured it was wolves, but we were not sure based on the way the corpses were. As it turns out, DNA evidence would actually point towards canines, but it was not wolf DNA which was strange. I mean, after all, there was an ample amount of wolves in Yellowstone, and they had proven to be a problem in the past at some points here and there, but not like this. We had never had a case like this where there was a campsite destroyed, and I mean literally torn to shreds, destroyed, nothing left, and three bodies found and mutilated, torn to bits. Now, it's important to say that when wolves kill, they do not leave bodies like this. I mean, there was nothing really eaten on. These bodies were just mutilated, strangled, and torn and tattered. There wasn't really much flesh left, it was just shredded to bits. There's not that many predators that actually do that and not eat their kill. Not many animals, if at all, that I'm aware of will kill just for the sake of killing. But that's what it appeared with these three bodies that we saw. And it seemed that this particular case that we worked on for a little while seemed to be the one tipping domino in the everlasting, or what appeared to be everlasting cases and sightings of strange things happening all around the park. Just after this had happened, an elderly woman in her 60s or later 60s was apparently attacked by a large upright walking animal as seen by other witnesses around before she was attacked. It was an attack so ruthless and violent that both of her arms were torn off and upon getting medical care, she died on the way to the hospital and we were never able to get a statement from her depicting exactly what had attacked her and why. Shortly after this had happened, a young married couple who had just been married maybe no more than two years were found dead after they had been missing for well over a week. Their bodies were recovered roughly about a mile or so away from their original campsite, but there's some very strange circumstances surrounding not only their disappearance, but their death. Their bodies appeared to be in perfect condition, not dirty, not filthy at all, no signs that they'd even been dragged or taken from their campsite. In fact, their clothing and bodies were pretty much spotless. It's as if whatever had taken them had laid them down perfectly on the ground where they were found. The bodies were found about 300 yards apart, the male found slumped up against a tree, while the female was wedged between two large boulders roughly, like I said, between 300 yards apart. The most disturbing part of this particular case is that both of their heads were missing. And this wasn't a case of something or somebody cutting it off, but rather tearing. The female's head was never found, but about three weeks after this, somebody had reported a strange object near the trail, and when we went to investigate, it was actually the male's head. Now at this point, he had been missing for well over a month, 
which means his head should have been out here in the wild, decaying and rotting, but it was almost in perfect condition. In fact, the blood was still coagulated where it had been torn from his head. There were no signs of decay, rot, or insects, even though we had found it in the middle of the forest. Something to note about his head was that his eyeballs were missing and his tongue had been removed. We weren't exactly sure who, what, or why this would happen, but we kind of concluded at the time that it was all based on ritualistic satanic cult killings. But oh, we would be so wrong to assume that. At the very end of September, we would also find a wandering naked man coming down one of the more popular trails. It just so happened that he ended up running into one of our fellow rangers and not a hiker, fortunately. Apparently, not only was he naked, but crazy and completely out of his mind. Upon digging a little deeper into his identity, it turns out his name was Edward and he was 44. He was a full-time construction worker and also worked as a foreman. This is a man who seemed very logical on the outside and had a very rich work history in physical labor. We had taken him in for questioning, clothed him, and asked him what he was doing and why he was out in the middle of the trail muttering to himself naked. Now, it turns out the man had been missing for nine days and last seen at a completely different portion of the park. And his story is that he was taken by a large black hairy creature, were his exact words, that he would describe as the bear man. And I guess when he was being questioned, his eyes were all over the place, he was not giving proper sentences, he was speaking in fragmented and broken sentences, and describing things at a very childish level. Almost like whatever it did had traumatized his brain so badly, he just reverted to a much more younger state, as they call it. And based on his story, this bear man had taken him out of his tent during the night and had taken him to this, what he described as an underground cavern that had a lake in it. We weren't exactly sure what to make of this portion of the story because it already seemed so far-fetched, but he went on to describe this underground cavern in great detail, describing the vast amount of human bones were around him and that there were several others of these tall, black, hairy creatures. He didn't really give much detail about what they looked like, like their face or their hands or any other part of their body, but just kept referring to them as the bear people and the bear man. At some point or another during this nine day stint, took his clothes from him and warned him to not tell anybody else about what had happened or they would come and eat him and devour him. But as he explains, they kept him alive. They fed him berries and other cooked meats, which he's not sure what it was. They never told him, they just offered him food which he sustained. He also explains that he was kept in this small little section of cavern, which he was guarded by two of these things. And at some point or another, they brought in some sort of metal device that put him to sleep, is exactly what he said. And the next thing he knows is that he woke up in the middle of a clearing in the forest, wandered off about a mile or two, and the next thing you know, he was on one of the paths where one of our partners had found him. As you're hearing this story unfold, you think to yourself, this man has either done a lot of LSD or he is entirely off his rocker because there is no way that these details, what he's describing, can even be remotely true. But as time would go on and you begin to hear all these stories that come out with not only David Pilates missing 4 and one but all the stories that have now come out as of 2022, there is far much more truth to his story than we can ever have imagined. But back in this time, remember, it was 1989, there was not near the amount of information to the public like there is now. We had put Edward through extensive testing, psychological testing, drug testing, and any other sort of family history he had of mental illness or any dementia, and he passed everything with flying colors. I am unsure personally, because I never followed through myself, if he ever made a full recovery. All I know is from the details that I was given and passed on and told during this time of when Edward was found. Now, I'd like to just preface all of this and just say that before I really dive into the meat of the story, these things were just the tip of the iceberg that was happening. And now we're going to venture a little bit deeper into the actual iceberg under the water. I had no idea that things were about to get far worse and things were going to escalate to a level I never thought possible. About seven weeks now had passed since the couple were originally found. And things had been happening all around the park, everything from seeing strange dark apparitions to hearing voices to seeing shapes all around. People were beginning to get very spooked. And although there was not a lot of talk amongst campers and rangers, 
you can tell that the attitude and demeanor was beginning to change. Part of that was also brought on by these strange men who at the time I thought were a part of the Secret Service but were in fact a part of the shadow branch of government who kept showing up, threatening a staff, threatening and speaking to hikers, demanding questions. They kind of just appeared and would come and go. I even spoke to my boss about it at some point or another, but he just claims that his hands were tied and he was not allowed to divulge in any information regarding who they were or what sector of government they are from. And as I recall, it was later on in October. We were soon approaching Halloween, and I get a call from a fellow ranger, one of my closer colleagues, whom informed me that there's a man that I need to speak to who had come in and spoken to this ranger, and he knew some of the things I had experienced and worked on, and he wanted to tell me his story. So we brought this man in, and he wouldn't tell me his name, but he seemed really nervous to say this, and I think ultimately, he was afraid of revealing too much information because he was afraid it would either get him detained or kicked out of the park, that something bad was going to happen if he would tell me his story. And fortunately, I was able to get information out of him and assure him that nothing would happen. So what he proceeded to tell me was that on the northeastern end of the park, there was a campsite that he found, a rogue lone campsite that belonged to, his words were, a deformed man. I had asked him curiously to give more information than just the words deformed man, and I could tell that he really paused and would stutter a lot, and he was genuinely scared at what he saw. He had a really hard time making eye contact and just expressing what had happened to him in his story. But he went on to tell me that what he thought was a deformed man was actually something else. And he begged us and begged us to not call him crazy, but would go on to describe what he would see as a wolf or bear-like creature in the head with long arms, massive claws, and strange blue and white markings all over its body. I asked him what he meant by blue and white markings, but he described them almost like tattoos, but not, and couldn't really give any more information. It was a very bizarre and very strange description. Now, how he had stumbled upon it was his claims were that he was sleeping and he was awakened by a voice calling him deeper into the woods. He says this voice wasn't a voice he could exactly place, like it wasn't a voice of somebody he necessarily knew or recognized, but he said it was a very calming, familiar voice. And he says he felt this sensation over him that he needed to follow this voice because it was leading him somewhere. And the way he described it was that he just needed to follow whatever this voice was to where it was calling him. And after following it for a while is when he came upon this clearing or this small row campsite and this being who did not seem to notice him. He also went on to describe that this being in this campsite was in a small ravine tucked away in the northeastern section of the park right near a large mouth of a cavern where he says he believes this thing came out of. And upon exiting or being so filled with fear and confusion that upon trying to leave, this thing heard him leaving and turned and looked right at him. And he described what he saw as having glowing red eyes. And he kept saying things like that he woke it up or he disturbed it or he did something to it to cause it to get angry. Because it said very quickly, it turned from curious and looking around to a very angry expression on its face. And it actually charged at him, climbing up the ravine to get to him. And he said he was so terrified, he retreated all the way back and actually ended up hiding in the forest for well over 12 hours before finding a ranger to contact and to tell his story to. Simply put, what he described was a monster and something that was very hard to swallow based on his given description. But, you know, when I look back at the things that have been happening for the past few months, not only with the young couple, but the elderly lady and Edward, who had been found and taken to an underground cavern, and this man, whose name I will keep anonymous, had described something similar that this, this bear wolf-like creature, also near the mouth of a large cavern, me and my partner, we kind of sat down and took notes and put two and two together. And we thought maybe there might just be a correlation between these events that are happening and we might get down to the bottom of this and find out exactly what's going on or get some more information. So we thought 
why not? It couldn't possibly hurt to go and explore and see exactly what he's talking about. So me and one of my good friends, which several of the rangers there were good friends, but this colleague in particular, whom I was closer to, we set out to go and explore the exact location at hand of where he was talking about. He even gave us a map with the exact coordinates to this place, which was roughly about four to five miles away from our current location. In hindsight, we should have really tried to go during the day where we had daylight with us and didn't have to try and just use flashlights to navigate because we weren't exactly believing what these people had to say. While we took it into consideration and understood and listened, we weren't thinking we'd actually see what we did this evening. Now, to get to this location specified by this gentleman, we had to go through quite a bit of backcountry. It was kind of steep in some parts, at least the way we went. I'm not exactly sure how this gentleman who described his story to us, how he got around it. I think he went around through the other parts of the timber, but I'm not exactly sure looking back on all of it, because it's been so long now, I'm just trying to remember certain details and not all of it is exactly clear, but I can remember it took us quite a few hours to get out there. And once we had safely made it to around the ravine area, I almost noticed a shift. I know that sounds dramatic, but it's almost like a change in temperature, how you can just feel something different. And that's kind of what it felt like. It, it was a feeling of being unwelcome. Now, just so you know, there are no campsites or anything around here generally open to the public around this portion of the park, at least during this time. The woods and timber were also growing increasingly thick, dramatically taking away our visibility. And coupled with the fact that the sun was already setting and dusk was growing even more, we had no choice but to use flashlights and to dig deeper into the woods to try and find out exactly what he was talking about. After venturing off into the deep timber for quite some time, we had found what my partner and I both describe as large humanoid tracks, and we don't use the words humanoid lightly. I say humanoid because it didn't exactly resemble that of a man's tracks. It was different. It was like an animal track and a man's combined, if that makes sense. The feet prints were elongated but also rounded, and it didn't exactly match the way a human print would indent into the ground. They were large, and there were also claw marks. And the stride points were also at least five to six feet long, which implied that a very large stride had happened. Now, the tracks were sort of faded, but we can generally make out where they were leading off to. And we followed these for about a mile and about a quarter mile until we found the ravine in question. We didn't exactly find the campsite which the man had been speaking about, but we believed that we found the cave in which everything had been circulating around. The ravine or canyon in which this took us to was a little bit larger than what we had initially thought, and with the sun now dipping behind the trees, visibility was worse than ever before. We could see that the canyon or ravine had dipped down enough and fed into the mouth of a rather large cave, and almost immediately, this primal level fear took over both my partner and I. It's like in that very moment, the stories that we had heard, everything, the sightings, the experiences from the missing persons to the events of Edward and our whistleblower, so to speak, were all coming to fruition and becoming more alive than ever before. Now, what I thought were merely just tales seemed more realistic than ever in my entire career as we were about to venture down and truly explore what is in this mouth of the cave. It could be potentially dangerous, we weren't sure. After giving ourselves a little bit of a pep talk and convincing ourselves, you know what, we're fine, we're trained in this, we're gonna be okay, let's do this together, and that we're not alone, we ventured down the side of the ravine into the smaller part of the canyon where the mouth of the cave lies. Now, as we got closer, we can kind of somewhat see into the mouth of the cave because it wasn't like it opened up into a large chamber. It kind of dipped down a little bit to where you can partially see inside. But something that my partner and I noticed right away was this faintly glowing, glimmering green light on the inside that would almost kind of pulsate back and forth. It would glow, and then it would die down. It would glow, then it would die down. And my partner and I kept looking back at each other thinking, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I mean, there's no way this could be happening. What could possibly be inside this portion of the cave that's emitting this much light, let alone a green light and pulsating? It was very, very strange and it intrigued our curiosity greatly. So 
we did our best to approach a little closer and kind of peek down and see what was in there. All the while this is going on, remember that those feelings of being unwelcome are still very much present, but we're doing our best to simply ignore it and press on with this mission. And as we get closer to the mouth of the cave and we're trying to further inspect this green, ominous, pulsating light, we began to get a whiff of the smell that seems to be coming out of the cavern as if air is pushing it out towards us. And the smell, I can remember it exactly like I was just there. It was like a mixture of blood, kind of an irony smell, along with rotting meat. And not just rotting meat, but meat that had been sitting out in the sun for days, almost like hot garbage or roadkill that you pull up and it's just been sitting there for days in the hot sun. Just a stink. And this underlying must that just hit our nostrils. It was like, have you ever ran over a dead skunk? How it has that rotting smell, but also this putrid, musty skunk smell? That's exactly what it was. So it's like if you took rotting meat, blood, and must, and this this powerful concoction of odor and pushed it into the air and it just hit our faces and I distinctly remember my partner commenting saying how the smell was making her queasy and this is all the while while we were climbing down the rocks to get closer to the mouth of this cavern. Now as we we're getting hit with this horrendous odor we begin to hear something large what sounds like multiple bits of movement coming towards the mouth of the cave from inside and as we we're hearing this our hair stands up all over our bodies and we feel like something really bad is going to happen. I'm sure you've experienced it multiple times in your life and if you have not, if you decide to read this or share this with your viewers, I'm sure they will have experienced it. There's just certain times in your life where you come into a situation where you know for a fact something bad is about to happen. That is exactly what we experienced. It comes from your gut. And I feel like it's your body's way of telling you, you need to get out now. You need to escape the situation you're in because things are about to turn bad right now. And I listened to my gut instinct. I was not going to press forward because we were going into unknown uncharted territory here. Ultimately had no idea what we were dealing with or could be potentially dealing with. And the stories in which I thought were somewhat fabricated were now turning to be real. So I grabbed my partner, we climbed our way back up somewhat and hid behind the small boulder to where we could still see the mouth of the cavern, but we were now, for the most part, concealed. And this is where things changed for me entirely in this given moment. What stepped out of the mouth of that cavern still gives me nightmares to this day and makes this story hard to write. What I saw, excuse me, what my partner and I saw what Edward, the witness, had described and the other gentleman described almost down to the T. We could hardly believe what we were looking at. It was like a bear and a wolf and a man put into one, I guess she would speak. And it almost had these white, bluish markings, almost like deep claw marks or scars. I guess scars is probably the best way to describe it. All over the front part of its body, down its arms. The hands looked just like human hands. They had four fingers unopposable and long claws that almost hung down to its side. The head itself was so massive, it looked like it was going to topple over on the body. It was somewhat of a mix of a wolf and a bear, if you can imagine what that would look like. It wasn't quite wolf, but it wasn't quite bear. It was something in between with almost humanistic features. I can remember vividly it having a very pronounced brow ridge, deep set in yellow reddish orangish eyes that almost seemed to pulsate light themselves, and a snout that was more broad and somewhat long, but not like a wolf where it's longer, but closer to that of a bear where it's shorter, and large fangs that reminded me of a reptile or a crocodile or something because of how much they shot out of the jaws. I mean, if there was ever a killing machine made in bioweaponry. What I was looking at was it. Not to mention the fact that the head itself was sitting on a man-like body. I mean rippling muscles, just chest, stomach, and arms that looked like it could easily outdo Arnold Schwarzenegger. The sheer presence of this being was enough to terrify me and my partner terribly. I mean we were shaking on the verge of tears just looking at this thing that was only about 35 feet away from us at most and behind it came two other beings that were very similar but slightly smaller. And we watched these things as they looked around, looked all at each other, and seemed to be communicating with each other. 
not with actual verbal speech, but we saw mouth movement to some extent and I didn't hear anything, but they were definitely communicating with one another. Absolutely, I, I believe that for a fact. And at one point, they began sniffing around like a wild animal would. And deep in my spirit, I just knew that our cover had been blown. They knew we were here and we had no choice but to leave now or something bad was really gonna happen. What was disgusting about it though is that parts of his chest, arms and face looked like they had been burned by a fire or maybe chemical burns. It was like mangy, rotting flesh almost. It was hideous and disgusting and very disturbing. And I still don't know if I was looking at a hybrid or a demon or a failed science experiment, but I was completely terrified out of my mind by looking at this thing and these three others that were with it. I just simply reached over, grabbed hold of my partner and I said, we need to leave now. It is non-negotiable, there is not an option, there is no choice anymore, we have to go. My partner did not even hesitate, she got it with me and we started to climb quickly up the rocks, back up to where the tree line was. And as this is happening, we hear this gut-wrenching scream bellowing at the, either the base of the cave or at the mouth of the cave. And instantly, I knew, oh my gosh, our cover's blown and these things are gonna come after us. The scream was like, if you took a hundred men and tortured them and put them all in one giant chorus and then dropped the pitch dramatically, it was like bellowing demons coming out of the mouth of this cave. And you could hear the base of this thing just echoing and reverberating all throughout the canyon and the small ravine where we were climbing out of. As we're climbing to the very top and getting out of this ravine, going into the timber in the direction that we came, we could hear movement of these things behind us coming up the rocks, coming up into the tree line as we are running for our lives. Whatever these things are, are gonna rip us to shreds and no one's gonna find us. The entire way back to the visitor center was just a blur. I think we were so hopped up on adrenaline, trying to move as quick as we could, all those miles back, I just, I think fear took over and I don't even remember. But I do remember having a conversation with my partner saying, how are we possibly gonna tell all the other rangers and our boss, what is he gonna say? How do we even approach this conversation? And I feel that for a period of time, we were followed in the woods by whatever those things were back there. Now, how far, I'm not sure, but they watched us and they knew we were down there. At this point now, it's been roughly about three or four days since my partner and I had ventured out to the base of this small canyon and had our nightmarish experience. And we had been kicking around the idea of how are we gonna tell our boss? What are we gonna say? How do we even open up this conversation? All the while, everything that had been happening up until this point was still going on. There was still people disappearing left and right. People were still reporting strange things, sounds, smells, everything. Nothing had stopped. We were still having those strange suited men coming up harassing hikers and campers, harassing staff and personnel. Nothing was stopping. In fact, everything was getting worse and we had to say something. I, we were no longer going to accept, I'm sorry guys, my hands are tied from our boss any longer. We wanted answers. And we feel like the experience we had just had days prior was enough to fully cement everything in and get what we needed to. So finally, my partner and I go into his office and we sit down and we tell him in detail exactly what we were told, what we found out, our experiences, and what had happened about three days prior. And I'm surprised that the entire time we had told him this story, he doesn't even do much or react much like we think. He's cold and stoic and just nods his head lightly. I think at points or another, he had asked us really vague, strange, riddle-like questions and ended the conversation with telling us to keep quiet and to not tell anybody about it. We felt like we had hit a dead end and we were totally unsure of how to go forward from now on. And I believe it was at this point that what we had told our boss, word must have got up because at several points over the following few days, my partner and I, specifically us, would be pulled to the side multiple times by people claiming to be military intelligence and these secret service looking guys being questioned, almost harassed, having these crazy nasty voicemails left at home telling us to not say anything and that we need to keep quiet or else things are gonna happen to us and our family. Just crazy things that you wouldn't expect to happen unless you were watching a movie like Die Hard or some sort of sci-fi action movie, but this is real life here. These kinds of things don't happen. So my partner and I were thinking, what is going on out here? And so finally, about a week into this going on, 
my partner and I are pulled into a room that we did not recognize and we were questioned for about two or three hours where we had told them everything. I mean, everything from what we knew to the experiences that we had been having at the park to what people had told us about. This includes campers, hikers, and other personnel and other staff. This also includes anything we knew about disappearances or any cases we were aware of and the details of which that we were aware. And ultimately, the experience that had happened to us now about 10 days ago at this point. And here, we were severely threatened with information that even I can't say. And we were informed the military would soon be on their way to clean up the situation. Now, I had no idea at the time why or the fact that the military should be involved and what were they cleaning up? What was going on that you would have to bring military personnel into the park? And it's almost like the events that have transpired since having this experience, this nightmarish experience of seeing these beings come out of the cave and being questioned had almost turned a switch for the park at the time. Because now more than ever, people were leaving in droves. Campers and hikers who were coming for just a day or maybe a night or two were terrified. You can tell there was just this general uneasiness lingering in the park, hopelessness, despair. It's like we were in mini hell. And the amount of sightings and reportings we had almost tripled uh, literally overnight. And now people were talking about seeing strange lights and shapes in the sky. And at this time, in 1989, people weren't really talking much about UFOs and aliens. And that sort of thing really wouldn't publicize itself until much later on, once pop culture became more prevalent with the internet and whatnot. So you have to understand, for this time frame, for this information to become so reported and so concentrated in such a small area, I remember there's this one man, incredibly distraught, by the way, who claims he had seen his dead wife approaching his camp and that there were several other of his dead family member also approaching. And he was so terrified that he had gone to sleep in his car the entire night and drive to the front end of the park. In the morning, he had come and told us, I mean, this guy was pale and very sickly looking. He was so terrified and would never come back. You know, you can take that sort of thing and write it off as schizophrenia, but in lieu of everything else going on and all these other reportings and sightings and strange things like sounds and abductions and lights in the sky and strange beings and ghosts, it's just, it adds up really strangely. Now, me personally, I am a huge fan of David Polite's work, and I've read all the Missing 4-in-1 series, considering I used to take part in Search and Rescue, and for this time being, was also a part of the forest service industry, and I believe, after reading much of his work on Yellowstone, that all the missing disappearances, kind of like some of the stuff I experienced myself firsthand, is all interconnected. I don't believe that the events that I'm telling you about was somehow the kickstarter to everything going on, but I firmly believe that these things going on have been happening long before I ever was employed as a ranger, long before the park was ever even opened or established as a national park. I believe that things had been happening in the force of America since long before we had even settled here. As the months drew on now, and all these things kept happening, up into spring of 1990 and even up to summertime, we were experiencing the lowest attendance numbers on record. But you will not find that in any documentation ever, online or any public records. It's all been classified, hidden away, and kept secret. And I also remember that during this time, from late fall to spring slash summer of 1990, that even staff was starting to experience strange and bizarre circumstances. In fact, some of the most common reported was the strange bangs and booms off in the distance, like dynamite exploding, but there's no visible dust clouds or explosions, just something large banging going off in the distance maybe a mile or so away, on all different directions. It was not in a specific location, but it was at random times throughout the day. There was no patterns, there was no, there's nothing you can connect to it really that would make it understandable or that you can kind of connect the dots and make sense of it. It was just random, strange, and terrifying. It was at this point that things had become so bad for so long that our superiors had no choice but to do a press release and acknowledge some of the things going on and address them. Now, I also remember too that around this time, roughly late spring, early summer of 1990, a large part of our staff were told to either keep quiet had been either fired, disappeared, or just completely removed in general from the park. I think they were transferred, but 
I don't know. I wasn't told much. All I know is just that a lot of people were not around anymore. In the press release given, the superiors of ours had to write everything off as satanic panic, which in the 80s was very big. There's a lot of talk about it and everything strange going on was simply just swept under the rug and just put as a cult activity. But many of his staff and personnel that work there know that that was not the case and there were far more sinister things going on in the park than just simply cult activity. And I feel that in my life, I was really coming to a crossroads because with everything going on and no signs of anything slowing down, I had to really reevaluate if I even wanted to continue my career, something that I had loved doing since I was a kid. I mean, I practically grew up in the woods. My dad and I would hunt all the time. I even tracked for a short time as a kid and getting to have this career was a dream of mine since I was seven. And the fact that I had to put all of this behind me and potentially leave this behind for good, that was hard for me to chew. But in lieu of everything, I wanted to keep my career and keep things going, so I just did my best and I stayed quiet and I bit the bullet for the time being. And now we're going into the later summer, early fall of 1990, about a year since all of this really began, and we're following the sightings and cases of all this paranormal, strange, unexplainable, and bizarre things happening in the park. The military starts showing up in droves and everyone including military and government personnel, are heading first to the northern sector of the park where the bulk of the activity seems to be taking place, although there is fragments of activity going on in the east, west, and southern sectors. And we were strictly told multiple times by not only military personnel and our supervisors to not interfere, do not speak to them, do not ask questions. We are simply not interact in any way, shape, or form unless you are spoken to or unless you are called out for questioning. Simply put, they are to do their job and you are to do your job. Do not interfere. And as a matter of fact, doing so will result in immediate termination. We didn't really ask any more questions. I think we were so emotionally spent and exhausted from all of these things going on. We didn't really care anymore. There was obviously something going on. We knew that. We weren't going to deny that, but the stakes were so high at this point because many of us did not want to lose our career. And even though this story that I'm telling you, I'm only briefly talking about my partner and I, many of us, staff at the time, had also been experiencing these things as well. So it's not just that everything is centered around my partner and I, many of us were going through these troubling times. I didn't really get the opportunity to speak much and ask questions to many other staff and personnel to get their stories heard, but I'm sure they're out there. The very next day, the entire northern sector of the park is completely shut down. There is no in or out, there's no access. They are doing something up there and then they start bringing in machinery. I'm talking large trucks, convoys, Humvees, vehicles and machinery I could not identify, things being brought in that were draped and covered, that looked very top secret, so something was clearly going on, and in this day, with everything that I now know and all the knowledge that is out there, I firmly believe that they were cleaning up one of their mistakes, which I could only pinpoint back to the experience that my partner and I had down into that ravine. I don't know if it was alien, I don't know if it was genetic experimentation, potentially cryptid, demonic, I don't know. But they were doing something and they were moving very fast and very secretive. And it was like this for at least three or four weeks and I think it wasn't until about Labor Day weekend when they just all of a sudden disappeared. It wasn't like these convoys and trucks just came out, they were just gone as if overnight the entire military crew were just disappearing. They didn't make any sense. I never saw anybody leave because when they were coming in, they took days to load everything in. That includes military personnel. It includes vehicles. It includes machinery. It includes teams and also government agencies that were showing up. And overnight, it's as if they were all gone, as if they just vanished. I mean, there is no way they could have cleared out of the park from that sector that fast without anybody seeing. Now, a few days after this had happened and things were beginning to reopen, albeit some parts were still closed off, but our supervisors informed all of the staff that if there's any sightings of strange lights in the sky, and they specifically talked about strange lights or strange objects seen in the sky, to not report it, to not write it up, to not talk about it. If a camper comes up and they show concern, or a hiker comes up and they talk about an experience that happened, you are to not 
write it down or document it in any way whatsoever. It was strictly forbidden. What's also weird is following this new rule is that activity had exploded for the next month all the way following until about November. And this whole time, I mean, we had gotten so many sightings and so many verbal reports from people camping or what people that were camping there were talking about seeing aliens and talking about seeing lights and UFOs and strange things. And we had several people who claimed they were abducted, tortured and worked on. I mean, just crazy stuff you could never imagine, but we weren't allowed to document it. We couldn't even record it. There's nothing we can do. So we had to let it go. Now, once we kind of came into November, activity greatly died down. In fact, it's almost as if things came to a standstill and we move over to 1991, coming the spring and summer again, where activity was still pretty dead. And that includes everything from sightings to UFOs to paranormal. And for the first time in a while, we were seeing a lot of hikers and people who just enjoy recreational camping coming back in mass amounts. And I feel like for the first time in a couple years, life was springing back to normal and we were actually getting to have somewhat of a normalcy again, which I'd been dying for. This now brings us to the final chapters of the story. Spring of this year was easily one of the best. We had seen a huge amount of people returning to the park to camp, to hike, to do any sort of recreational activities. At this time too, we had also just received a tremendous amount of money in the form of several grants from the government for our park to kind of reestablish itself. And I thought things were heading in the right direction. Now comes summertime, things are still looking very good, but now we get towards the end of summer again, about August into September, and activity starts to pick back up. It starts in the form of people reporting large unusual wolves, black wolves, gray wolves, and white wolves. Now these wolves weren't just any wolves, but wolves that would stand upright. And people had also reported seeing wild men, not Bigfoot or Sasquatch like you're probably thinking, but wild men wielding spears looking like cavemen almost or Neanderthals. Very, very strange accounts, very, very strange accounts and sightings and all those things. And also humanoids. People wouldn't use the word humanoid, but they would describe these human shapes following them in the park and seeing them off in the distance. Activity quickly exploded from almost nothing to more than it was a year ago. And remember our rule from here on out that we weren't allowed to take down any more sightings or reports, but now that things were kind of coming up and back, I decided, even though I can get terminated for this permanently, that I was gonna start taking down these notes and start taking down these encounters for my own sake. A gentleman I spoke to, I had to speak to in secrecy because if it had been discovered that I was taking down notes, I could have gotten fired. I remember his sighting in particular was one that frightened me. And he described, he was a solo camper by the way, a really nice gentleman in his later 30s, that he had spotted a creature that resembled what he would describe as half lion, half human, that was mimicking his wife's voice, calling him into the woods. And it wasn't something that he'd heard. He had actually seen this being standing up in the brush from about chest high up. And so he saw everything in broad daylight and it was doing this to him. He describes with a finger motion, mimicking his wife's voice, calling him by name, telling him to come here, to come deeper in the woods, to follow me. This man was so petrified, he was bawling like a baby, recounting his experience to me in private as I'm writing these details down. Somebody who is that terrified doesn't just simply make this up. And if he did, give the man an Academy Award for being the best actor of the year. So I firmly stand by his demeanor, by the way he recounted the experience, that he was honest in telling the truth. And this was just one of many things going on. I didn't document and take down a lot of cases like I should have, but things like that I did sort of write down on my own time of what I could remember. Murders now were becoming much more frequent and disappearances. And you might think murders in a very traditional sense of somebody killing somebody. We were more so finding people who had been murdered or killed in very either ritualistic style killings or just killed under bizarre circumstances or killed by wild animals. It was never a traditional somebody shot somebody, somebody stabbed somebody. It was far more gruesome than those things. And unfortunately, a lot of us staff were the ones that discovered the bodies. Much of these killings were written down as cult killings or ritualistic killings and simply put on paper to just pass it along and not deal with it anymore. Our park management was desperately trying to save face for the new influx of traffic that was coming in. They did not want to have anything happen that would affect that negatively. 
So they're doing everything they can to hide any public information, to write anything off, to be releasing press releases that would dismiss everything going on to greatly keep traffic and money and revenue flowing into the park and the park system. And I remember things getting so bad that I actually started having a shotgun around me almost all the time. And even on night patrols and evening patrols, I distinctly remember feeling followed and watched almost everywhere I went. I mean, there was no safe spot in the park that I can remember being at. And you could even tell that campers were starting to experience this again too, like they had a year or two prior. And things were going into a very, very dark chapter, I feel. And there was even rumors at the time that if this activity kept going on and kept getting reported, that our park would be shut down permanently. I don't know how much truth there is to that statement or threat, but it must have been taken pretty seriously by upper management since they were very strict on not allowing us to report or take down any reports of sightings or anything going on. They actively worked very hard to ensure that this park had none of that going on and that the cult killings were simply just dismissible and unexplainable. The last straw came when a large family a mom and dad, a young daughter, a very little baby, and a son, a teenage son, all disappeared from the lodge without a trace. Nobody had seen where they went. We have no idea what happened to them. They were last spotted at the lodge and their car was discovered, completely intact, still in the parking lot. Their campsite was as if they had simply just abandoned it with everything set up completely untouched. And to this day, to my recollection, they were never found and there was no trace of them ever found. And so something happened to that family. I don't know what happened or where they were taken, but they're gone. And I got a call from one of my fellow rangers, not the same partner I had before, but another friend of mine, another colleague of mine, and he calls me about 2.30, 2.40 in the morning. And he says, you gotta get up here now. You're not gonna believe this. You gotta come check this out. And so I kept asking him, what? What is so important that I have to get up and see? but he convinced me that you need to see this. It's very important. So I get up, I get dressed, I come out there and he informs me, we're gonna go on a little hike in the back country because something's going on and we need to get it cleaned up before it gets out of hand. Completely confused by what he's talking about, I simply follow him because he's a man who's never led me astray before. And about two miles away from our location, we came upon a clearing where it had happened carved in the ground was about a 15 foot pentagram in diameter that was actually carved into the ground, not dug, but actually carved by some tool that we weren't sure what did it. Beyond the pentagram, about 30 feet into this clearing were seven bodies. They were all hooded, black robes hooded. It looked to be some sort of cult's ritual or something, but each of the members that we'd found, assuming that they were members because there was no identity ever given to these seven bodies, all of their heads were missing, just like in the case we had found two years prior to the young man and woman who were married, who were also found without their heads. Now these seven members that we had found, none of their heads were ever found. Their heads were removed in the exact same fashion as the young woman and young man. As we alerted authorities, our supervisors and upper management panicked to do everything they could to suppress the information getting out and to not attract the press because things like this don't just sit there. I mean, they get press attention very quickly. So they had to pull some strings and do what they could to get things under wraps and keep everything hush, hush. And I feel like things, especially after this particular event, began to take a much darker turn and everything and activity was greatly increasing at tremendous rates. And I feel like I cannot continue on this path anymore of constantly being berated by my upper management, being told and threatened to keep quiet or my livelihood and my career would be in jeopardy and not being able to take down reports or settings or give the time of day to these poor people and families who were experiencing these horrendous things and had nobody to turn to and had nobody to listen to. And with everything going on that I've discussed thus far, I can no longer do this. I can no longer be a part of this corrupt system. And so I retired from being a park ranger in December of 1991. I kept close tabs with several of my friends and colleagues, particularly my partner in which I had the experience with about a year ago, going down near that mouth of the cavern and kept in close contact with her until her disappearance in 1994, which I believe either the park took her or the government took her or did something to her because she knew things and was threatening to blow the whistle on all of it. 
like me, she was sick and tired of seeing all these secrets, all these conspiracies, everything being hidden down, and she demanded and believed that the public had a right to know what was going on in the park and was done keeping secrets. Now, she had come to our boss, apparently, from what she had told me over dinner, and after she had threatened him that she was going to reveal everything to the public, within a week's time, I didn't hear from her anymore. I had called her, visited her house, nothing. She was just gone. And come to find out that she was on the national missing persons list, she was never found, according to my knowledge. Our last dinner together, she began revealing more information to me about what was going on to the park. Because even though I retired at the end of 91, she continued working and actually moved up in management, apparently, from being in her position. And she had learned some things about the military and why they were showing up there and things like that. And apparently, into 92, 93, and 94, the military was upping their volume and coming into the park yet again. Hopefully, not to clean up their situation, but hopefully to take care of whatever it is that was happening but activity still continued to increase. Now, I remember when we were having dinner, she was so wide-eyed and telling me all these things and she wasn't even focused on eating her dinner. She was just blown away by the amount of secrets that were kept and the things that were going on. She kept saying and referring to a giant conspiracy that was happening with Yellowstone, specifically Yellowstone. And then she kept using words like the darkness or a darkness or that something was going on either underneath Yellowstone or a part on the outer section of Yellowstone. And she told me that there were so many details and so much information she knew, she was going to have to write it up in documentation and give it to me to keep safe. And unfortunately, before she was able to document that and write it all up, she disappeared. So I believe that she was taken out or something had happened to her because she simply knew too much information. And since all of these events have transpired, I've tried my best to basically just remove myself from any of my past career life or any of that. I don't have contact anymore with anybody. I don't even think about that life anymore. I've since moved states and live a completely different life just to try and separate myself from my past. I figure now that since I'm getting older, it's probably time that I write this story up and share it with the rest of the world so they too can know what's going on. If anybody out there hears this story, just know that be cautious, keep an eye out, and wherever you go, you're not safe. You are not safe. What Yellowstone shows you and what all the national parks show you is what they want you to see. It is what they want the public eye to know. But deep down, there are much darker secrets that are concealed that the public eye will never see. And that darkness is bleeding through and affecting things more than you could ever imagine. If you guys enjoyed today's story, go ahead and slap the heck out of that subscribe button. Make sure you pound the like button and leave a comment below telling me why you like this video and some content you'd like to see in the future coming. I got a lot of really cool ideas and things that I do want to implement down the road and different styles of content and formats I want to experiment with. So I'm glad you made it this far and I hope to see you guys in the next video. Take care, be safe, and I'll see you then.